discovery of superfluidity in helium-3, uh, which is a uh, analog to superconductivity in metals. Well, I tell you, when we did the work, I don't think anyone expected that it would win a Nobel Prize. And I think it's frequently true that, that it was the work of a lot of other people uh, uh, measuring properties and, and producing the theory that explained what we had seen uh, that, that made it a, a valuable uh, classroom for uh, scientists to learn what kinds of order are possible in nature. Helium-3 uh, superfluids were the first examples of what are called unconventional BCS states, uh, such as the su high temperature superconductors. Well, as I said, uh, we didn't think that, we were hoping we would get something called the London Prize for this, uh, but, but ironically that never happened. I think it was 1976, there was a uh, international meeting that I attended, uh, and it was shortly after that that people started telling me that, that they had nominated me for the Nobel Prize, which is something they're not supposed to do. And over the years, uh, I would say on almost a yearly basis in uh, something, you know, uh, usually in, I think the, no, the, so to nominate for the Nobel Prize, you have to be invited to do so. And those invitations tend to go out in something like December or January, I can't remember. So then people would fill these things in. And, and, there, and I think it expressly says you're not supposed to tell the person that you're nominating that, that you're doing so, but, but that's exactly what doesn't get done. And so on a yearly basis, I would realize there was some possibility that, 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 that I would share the Nobel Prize. Uh, and I, I dare say that, that when the phone call finally came uh, 24 years later, I, uh, from the time that, that the discovery was made, I you know, was certainly not ready for it. In our case, uh, superfluidity in helium-3 uh, was, in fact, predicted, I think, as early as 1959, uh, two years after the publication of the BCS theory, which explained the origins of superconductivity in metals. Uh, and I think it was uh, Phil Anderson, who's a good friend of mine, was one of the first people that, that authored a paper suggesting that, that helium-3 might undergo a similar kind of a phase transition. But I think the original estimate was that TC would be uh, 80 thousandths of a degree, which may sound cold to some of your viewers, but in fact the actual transition temperature varies from 0.9 thousandths of a degree or uh, up to 2.49 thousandths of a degree. So, so in fact their temperatures were way off and people searched for the transition for uh, better part of a decade, ultimately reaching two thousandths of a degree, not finding any superfluidity. And, and that was all, I think, that ended in about 1965, just two years before I came, became a graduate student. So when I became a graduate student, the general uh, wisdom was that, that, that superfluidity in helium-3 was, was a pipe dream of the theorists. But in fact, it, it actually did occur. Well, I must say I know two Nobel laureates who have fingers missing from experiments with gunpowder. I, in fact, have been much, much carefuler than they have. Uh, so a lot of people did crazy things when they were young. I think my high in, when I was in high school, I, it, uh, junior and senior year, I built a 100,000 volt x-ray machine. And I always assumed that there were no x-rays being generated unless I turned on the filament. but. Uh, that is not the case. <laughs> so I think a lot of us did crazy things. Uh, uh, most of them, for me, were, were experimental, uh, but they, I think, gave me very good physical intuition. Uh, I think I had a very good set of hands for, for building a very delicate, sensitive apparatus. So, you know, I think that when I became a graduate student, uh, uh, by the time I did, of course, I'd already taken many physics classes at Caltech, uh, and I was really ready almost from the very beginning uh, to, to, uh, to make my mark in experimental science. 
Uh, I built a helium-3, helium-4 dilution refrigerator my first year of graduate study. Now, it didn't work until my second year, but that's okay. The issue about, about uh, how valuable that kind of experience is, uh, or how it is valued by people that are admitting uh, students to uh, the undergraduate curricula at various colleges and universities, uh, I think at Stanford we still value that kind of thing, but in fact uh, at Stanford it, it is not the the physics department that admits the undergraduates that say that they're likely to major in physics. There are a bunch of professional people that do that and, and I don't know how much they value that sort of thing. There are lots of, of, of activities that they, they know enough to value, such as the International Physics Olympiad and the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair and Inter Intel Science Talent Search. For instance, the first year, I was a judge for the Intel Science Talent Search, and the first year I, I did that, uh, two of the students, the students who were number one and number two, uh, uh, were both in physics, and they both now are graduate students in physics at Stanford University, and one of them, by the way, is here at this event now. Undergraduate students is a really complicated issue. I mean, you have to divide that up. Uh, I teach one of these large uh, lecture courses at Stanford, and, uh, you know, I don't know, out of 300 students, I, I think I would probably see about 80 uh, uh, in my office for office hours and you know we talk about anything they want to talk about. Uh, usually it's how to do the problem set that's due that Friday or something like that but not always. And you know I think the idea of, uh, of course with uh, uh, mentoring as opposed to teaching undergraduate students is, is try to get them excited about learning and about science and, and try to get them to realize that, that one of the most important things they have to do as an undergraduate is decide what to do next. I think, you know, the hottest thing right now is, uh, in some sense, of course, is, is nanoscience. And there's a lot, of, a lot of people doing it, a lot of interesting things coming out. It's always a question in my mind as to whether we're producing too many people who are very good at nanoscience. I think, in some sense, it is a bit an indication that that uh, uh, the, the bulk condensed matter physics that, that, that I have known and loved over the years is, is in fact uh, understood fairly well. And so one looks for other areas where, in fact, the understanding is less complete. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, so, I, I, you know, there, of course, was a period when almost every new person uh, in, in, in that was getting a grant in, uh, for kinetic matter physics was studying high temperature superconductivity and, and those days are over and, and you know my guess is that, that it doesn't matter uh, what it is that you studied as a graduate student uh, it, the important thing is, is learning how to study and how to understand uh, what nature is doing and that's what it's all about.